Another week in the U.S., another mass shooting, the latest in Odessa, Texas. Seven lives lost and many more injured. Layla Hernandez, Edwin Peregrino, Mary Granados, Cameron Cartless Brown, Raul Garcia, Joe Griffith, and Rodolfo Arco. These are the names we should remember. We've all got to do our part to end gun violence in America. That starts by learning about the problem and the solutions. Over the past year and a half, I've devoted myself to this cause. If you agree that more people need to learn about the science of gun violence and what we can do about it, please share this podcast with them. These are important conversations we all need to hear. Thanks for listening. Now, on with the show. This episode of In Sickness and in Health talks about suicide and mass shootings. Please listen at your own discretion. They feel like nobodies, and by killing large numbers of innocent victims, they're able to guarantee that they become somebodies. So people know that if they do this, they get noticed and they get talked about. The young man in his own mind will have developed the belief that he has a right to kill other people for the injustices that have been delivered upon him. Welcome back to In Sickness and in Health, the podcast about health and social justice. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This season, we're looking at gun violence in America. To start off today's show, I'm just going to get out of the way. I want you to hear from someone who's been impacted by gun violence and suicide in one of the worst ways imaginable. This is Sue Klebold talking about her son. He was a high school student in Colorado. He had been accepted at four colleges. Uh, He had been accepted at the university of his choice. A couple weeks before, we had gone on a college visiting trip. And as far as we knew, he was finishing up his school year. He was living those happy pre-college years that many of us remember. Uh, And he had a prom. He went to a prom with uh, a friend of his. And uh, they all, you know, they rented a limousine and they all had their tuxes and their long dresses and they went to out to dinner. And then while they were at the prom, they went dancing and he picked up, you know, his tuxedo and the corsage. And it was a happy time. I I remember I filmed him. uh, He was joking into the camera. He threw a little snowball at my husband because he was annoyed at being filmed. And... um, it was about 4.30 in the morning when he got home. And I got up to talk to him. And, uh, and, he, and he said, Mom, he said, I've had the best time I've ever had in my life. And I just wanted to thank you for, you know, for sending me and for making it possible for me to go. And uh, I just felt like this was a wonderful time, a wonderful boy. Everything was fine. Four days later, he was dead, and he had participated in a school shooting. Sue is the mother of one of the Columbine shooters. When people say to me, how could you not know, I have to go back and say, I saw a child who was preparing for his future, talking about his future, thanking me for things that I had done for him. You know, it was, I was totally baffled by what he did and had no, uh, no concept that such a thing could be on his mind. What was going on in the mind of this young man? If his mother couldn't see what was festering within him, who could? Mass shootings seem to us impulsive, random, just plain evil. But there are common traits and triggers that many mass shooters share. If we look at the trajectory, uh of these individuals' lives, often you see that they were suicidal before they were homicidal. Many of our reactions from schools to the media at large are backfiring. We've kind of created this mythology and this script around this form of violence. And so I think that's why we see it on the rise. But there are warning signs. An FBI study that was published in 2018 that found that 88% of the Adolescent public attackers had told a third party of their intent to attack. That, if acted on, 
can stop someone who's planning mass murder. If they are aware that a friend has obtained the means by which to die or kill, that they have a, a big responsibility to share that information. In this episode of In Sickness and in Health, the psychology of mass shooters. Before his death, if you had asked me how well I knew my son, I would have said I knew him very well, that we had a good relationship, and that uh, I had no doubt that he would grow up to be a, a good person, a good citizen, a good steward of the planet. He was somebody that I um, had great faith in and adored. He was extremely bright. That was the first thing that struck me about him as a, as a child. He was... He learned so quickly, and everything came so easily to him. He was a kind of boy who liked to manage his life. Sue says her son was the only one in their family who could save money. He asked how to do his own laundry when he was 10. He liked to be in control. When you take a kid for whom everything had sort of gone his way most of his life, when these kids begin to experience thoughts that are frightening or suicidal, um, they don't know what to do with that. They don't know how to handle those feelings. And those, and they're so used to considering themselves uh, perfect and in control that when these things start to happen, it hits those kinds of kids especially hard. I believe that when his thoughts started to become unpleasant and then he started having suicidal thoughts and feelings, I think he believed that that was a uh, personality flaw, that was something wrong with him. And he uh, had trouble accepting that and that imperfection. Then when this happened, it made me realize that I'd been living a life of, uh, that was just delusional, that just, it didn't exist. What I was feeling was his reality and our reality was not. Sue saw her son getting ready to graduate, going to prom with friends, going off to college. But after the Columbine shooting, another version of her son came to light. I learned long after his death that he was talking and thinking about suicide. And uh, we found something that he'd written, the police found it and returned it to us, that when he was 15 years old, he had written a page uh, where he described uh, being in agony and wanting to die and wanting to get a gun and to kill himself. He described cutting himself. And these were things that were happening that I had no idea. In terms of really being alone, you know, from my perspective, I'm here telling him that I love him and I'm hugging him. And that was such a shock to me as a mother to, to see writings when he would talk about feeling alone or being alone because I couldn't understand how someone could feel that way when they were so loved. But it's not uncommon and many people do feel that way. In our last episode, we talked about why people die by suicide, isolation, thinking they're a burden on others, and the capability to act on those suicidal thoughts. In hindsight, some of these traits could be seen in Sue's son. But in the case of mass shooters, suicidal thoughts can metastasize into something else. There were incidents of of having, you know, trash thrown at them and being knocked down in the hallway, uh, people picking on them and, you know, shoving them around and squirting them with ketchup and, and really humiliating experiences that I think drove the two boys together because they experienced these things when their friends were not around to see it. He was so self-focused on just this little micro-feelings of of whatever he was experiencing, vengeance, rage, um, and wanting life to be over. From what we were able to observe, failed belongingness, you know, being bullied, those are things that we really were not aware of. The important thing here is that if one has a feeling of, of... that they don't belong, that they're different. It's very difficult to understand that someone may have that feeling and yet 
to us, may, that may not look like it's possible. The U.S. saw its first mass shooting in 1949 when a 28-year-old man killed 13 people while walking through his neighborhood in East Camden, New Jersey. But the Columbine shooting in 1999, which took place some 50 years after that first mass shooting, marked the beginning of a new, gruesome, and uniquely American phenomenon, school shootings. Mass shootings feel like they happen all the time, and there's something to that. They've become a lot more frequent. In the month of August alone, 53 people were killed in four different mass shootings in the United States. But despite the attention they attract, mass shootings are relatively rare. It feels like they're not, but they account for less than a half of percent of all gun violence in America. 60% of gun deaths are suicides, and the majority of it is gang-related. And so it's still, it's a very small sort of percentage of gun violence, but of course it affects us in a different way. This is Jillian Peterson. She's a professor at Hamline University. She's also the co-founder of The Violence Project. For the past two years, we have been researching the psychosocial life histories of all mass shooters. Jillian's research is trying to understand the motivations of mass shooters. Her team has been interviewing people who knew them, family and community members, and sometimes even the shooters themselves. When you look at hundreds of mass shooters, there's no profile that really emerges where I can sort of check these boxes and say, here's what everybody has. But we did see these patterns emerge in the data that led us to these four kind of key pieces that you see across the board. Those key pieces tend to be early childhood trauma. So you see things like parental suicide, the sexual abuse, physical abuse, pretty significant trauma. A triggering event that speeds up their planning and preparations. This could be days, weeks, or even months before the incident, but something happens that is kind of the last straw. Mass shooters study other mass shooters. When someone's talking about mass violence or showing you know, a great interest in the Columbine killers, those are huge red flags. And the means and capability to follow through with the killing. The vast majority of these mass shootings are suicides. The vast majority of people who are suicidal would never dream of doing something like this. But I do think what we've seen is that these truly are suicides. There's only been one or two cases where the person went in and had a plan to get out. Most of the time they go in with the intention of dying in the act or they're, you know, what I refer to as life indifferent, meaning that they don't care whether they live or die. This is Adam Lankford. He's a professor at the University of Alabama. And I've been uh, researching mass murderers and terrorists and mass shooters for, frankly, far too long now. Adam agrees that most mass shooters are suicidal. If we look at the trajectory of these individuals' lives, um, often you see that they were suicidal before they were homicidal. So we saw that with, for example, the uh, Parkland school shooter, who I believe referenced committing suicide, you know, after some family trauma and the loss of his mother, and then moved on to the idea of mass murder suicide, although he actually ended up surviving. Adam's research also looks at some of the other motivations behind these attacks. One of the most important is that shooters see themselves as the victims of whatever group they target. Both of those perpetrators in the case of Columbine had a sense that they were disrespected and underappreciated, which actually interacts with the third factor that is not always present in the case of public mass shooters, but is more common among the deadliest perpetrators, which is that they often seek fame or attention. It's no accident many of these shooters target schools. It's not because they're gun-free zones. It's because this is where they think they were victimized. In the case of the Columbine shooters, you can kind of understand their desire for fame and and attention as a overcompensation for their sense that they weren't respected or appreciated enough. So they said things like, won't it be great to get the respect we're going to deserve, right? So they anticipated you know, unfortunately, correctly, that, for example, movies would be made about them, that their faces would be on the front of magazines and things like that. 
They didn't get respect in life, so they seek it out in death. Individuals who do this want notoriety in death that they don't have in life. They want this to go viral. They want people to watch and see it and to read their manifestos and to talk and say their names afterwards. These are performances meant to be watched. And the media is rewarding mass shooters with the fame and attention they seek. I think that the media plays a big role in terms of spreading the contagion. I turned on some 24-hour cable news network the other day, and it was just constant pictures of the perpetrator. And it just made me so sad because that's the exact opposite of what we want to be doing. We should be covering victims and heroes in these acts more so than we're covering perpetrators. Adam Lankford agrees. Really the key here is that it's possible to give the public the information they need about these incidents, the details on on what happened and why it happened and how to prevent it from happening and what the warning signs were without giving attention to the individual perpetrators. And just as one example, you know, no one ever looks at the face of someone who committed a public mass shooting and thinks, oh, I've seen this person's face, now I know how to prevent mass shootings. That's not actionable information. It's simply putting it out there really to get clicks or to, or to put a, a face and a name with a crime. But what the research suggests is that that's actually contributing to the problem. This kind of fame-seeking connects with other psychological traits shared by mass shooters, narcissism and paranoia. The narcissism is very pervasive in these cases where there's a sense of grandiosity, that one is larger than life, and there's also a very strong sense of entitlement that I can uh, do what I want when I want to. Unfortunately, that entitlement can also drive the desire uh, to kill other people in retribution for how one has been treated. This is Reed Malloy. I'm a forensic psychologist. Reed says paranoia and narcissism can play different roles for different shooters. Paranoid shooters believe they're the target of a conspiracy by a specific group. One of the really concerning things we're seeing in our, in our culture, in our society now, where individuals will develop a general animus toward a group. Uh, for instance, the young man uh, who has been uh, spurned or rejected by a young woman he wanted to go out with, uh, and uh, begins to think that now, not only does this young woman not like him, but all women are bad, all women are evil and conspiring against him and withhold actively withholding from him. We call it target dispersion. We see this prominently in a group called the incel movement, which, which are the involuntary celibates. These targets could involve anyone, women, immigrants, Muslims, African-Americans, there's often a manifesto that attempts to justify attacks on these groups. The Swedish security gave this a, a name that they communicated to me that I thought was really good. They call it a they call it copy paste ideology, where these young men will just, in a sense, copy paste from various documents to try to create some kind of belief system to provide a rationalization for their for their killings. And a lot of times, there's contradictions uh, between those beliefs. Reed says shooters' paranoia and narcissism coalesce into something he calls a compensatory fantasy. In other words, they turn inward and they spend a lot of time having fantasies that are both violent and uh, grandiose and also oftentimes retaliatory. This is especially true for adolescent shooters. This is a very, very critical aspect of their internal lives that moves an adolescent whose life perhaps is not going very well in the real world, they again withdraw into this fantasy life where they're compelled by the pleasure of both violent and, and grandiose thoughts of oftentimes retaliation, revenge, and then uh, perhaps notoriety as they think about carrying out a violence toward other individuals. The act of shooting someone to death seems like it would seize someone in the moment, but like suicide, Mass shootings are rarely impulsive. Reed calls it predatory violence. I think that we are wired to uh, maintain uh, a sense of calmness and a sense of focus when we're in a predatory mode of violence. And that's what we see with mass murderers. That does make it difficult if you're only looking at intense anger 
or intense rage or fear as a marker for risk of carrying out an act of targeted violence. But those of us in the field know that just intense emotion is not telling us uh, anything about whether or not this person is planning an attack. But that doesn't mean there aren't warning signs. Sue didn't realize it at the time, but in retrospect, there were clues. He had a brush with the criminal justice system. He had stolen something 14 months before their death. Well, that was completely out of character for him. They practiced and they rehearsed and they, you know, they went out to the woods apparently and, and shot guns and they purchased guns and they had a plan. And yes, they were, they were enacting that to be able to carry that out. I think there certainly was a series of thresholds that they crossed over. Uh, and, and even talking about, you know, cutting himself when he was 15 years old, was that a threshold? Was that him trying to acclimate to some kind of self-harm so that would be something he could practice, perhaps, his own uh, death? Or was that an attempt to calm the, his bad thoughts and focus himself on his body and get out of his mind where it was so uncomfortable? The warning signs other mass shooters have displayed are eerily similar to those of the Columbine shooters. The other thing that we're seeing is just a marked change in behavior. And this is going to look different for everyone, but somebody just acting differently and some and something that you're feeling concerned about. And of course, 99.99% of the time, a person in crisis is not going to do a mass shooting, but it's better to cast a wide net. Adam Lankford. There are some blatant and glaring uh, warning signs that actually are, are surprisingly common. And specifically, I'm saying one of the major findings from looking at the most deadly attacks is that in many cases, the perpetrators specifically admitted having homicidal or suicidal thoughts or even that they were interested in mass killing. This was the most surprising thing I learned speaking with these experts. The vast majority of shooters actually tell other people they want to die and they want to commit mass murder. Adolescent mass murderers and uh, adolescent target attackers will typically communicate their intent 60 to 90% of the time. Reed Malloy. This figure is very robust and has been now validated by uh, studies, up to and including an FBI study that was published in 2018 that found that 88% of the adolescent public attackers had told a third party of their intent to attack. Even adult mass shooters will tell someone of their plans between 50 and 60% of the time. So what are we missing if mass shooters are literally telling others their plans? We see two things. Which have to do with the people they're talking to. One is that people just don't take it seriously, or they don't want to get someone in trouble, they don't want to be seen as overreacting to something. Two, we see that these things do get reported to the authorities, but the authorities really don't have a, any means to do anything about it because a crime hasn't actually been committed. But even if a shooter has all the immediate warning signs, suicidality, deifying past shooters, collecting guns, openly expressing interest in violence, there are legal limits to what law enforcement can do. Adam Lankford told me a story that shows just that. There was a case in 2018 in Orlando after the Parkland shooting where a university student was identified by police and he cited the Las Vegas and Parkland shooters as his heroes. He'd posted that online, that they were his heroes. And uh, when he was interviewed by police, he said, well, it would take, me a, uh, take a lot to push me over the edge, but basically said that he would consider committing a shooting at a middle school or high school where he'd been bullied growing up if he had some sort of crisis, if he had a romantic breakup or if he was fired from a good job or something like that. And remarkably enough, in that case, the judge basically said, well, um, you know, it's the student's uh, free speech to say that mass shooters are heroes and that maybe this, the quote was just that the uh, young man maybe wanted to look like a badass on Reddit. Jillian Peterson agrees. Right now, the police usually don't have a means to go in and take weapons away. 
you know, we interviewed one parent of a would-be perpetrator and actually went to the police and said, will you take these weapons away? And they couldn't because they just don't, don't have that jurisdiction. If the would-be shooter is still a minor, there's at least the chance for a parent or some other adult to step in. Sue Klebold again. If they are aware that, that a friend has obtained the means by which to die or kill, that they have a, a big responsibility to share that information with a responsible adult. Because if I had known that Dylan owned a gun, I would have totally freaked out, been parenting differently, been doing everything differently. I recently talked with somebody. She said that when the kids were in the car and, and they drove by the school, they'd once pointed to the school with their fingers like they were guns and went to an end. It was a playful thing. It was just something that kids would do when they drove by their school to act like they were shooting it or blowing it up. But is that leakage? You know, do we consider something like that leakage? She certainly didn't because they were just in the car messing around. So, you know, I think anything is potential leakage. He wrote a paper about uh, being a bullet and telling a story from the point of view of the bullet. Is that leakage? You know, so I guess what we have to do is be incredibly aware you know, don't let anything go by and not and, and not question it and, uh, as, and and assume that everything is fine when any little hint that something may not be. So with all this information, what can be done to stop a potential mass shooter? Unfortunately, many of our reactions to these tragedies, even when we have the best of intentions, can backfire. For example, shooter drills at school. Our data has made me think that we should not be drilling children. I think certainly we want all adults in the school to be trained and know what to do in the worst case scenario. But our data found that 91% of the time, the perpetrator is a student of the school. So if you think about that, 91% of the time, the perpetrator is running through the lockdown drills and they know the school's exact response. And so all of the money that we put into heightened security measures and into training run, hide, fight, the students are going through that training and they know how to get in and out of that school. And we've even seen that in certain cases, that knowledge increases casualties. It doesn't decrease them. And then secondly, I'm a psychologist and I've done some work looking at the psychological impact of those training drills. And we do know that it has an effect on kids and the way they see the world. And then the third concern is the fact that we know these are socially contagious. We know that students follow a script and get fascinated by it. And are we inadvertently handing out this script and normalizing this at very young ages? But there is one aspect to these attacks that works in favor of prevention. Shooters often plan their attacks weeks, months, or even years in advance. This creates an opportunity for someone to notice and take action. Sue Klebold wrote a book, in part, to tackle this on a personal level. All proceeds from her book, A Mother's Reckoning, Living in the Aftermath of Tragedy, are donated to support research on mental health and suicide prevention. In her book, Sue explains that just because profiling doesn't work doesn't mean violence can't be prevented. Prevention does not require prediction. I think one of the most important things we have to do as a society is to learn how to talk to somebody to find out if they are struggling. If we observe behaviors that are different, to be able to say to them, I notice that, and then fill in the blank. You know, you're not sleeping, or, you know, you, you've been sleeping in class, or uh, you did this, you wrote a violent paper, or you, you weren't uh, at an event that I thought you wanted to go to. And when, and when people do those kinds of things, sometimes they're really struggling with bad thoughts and feelings. Are you having bad thoughts and feelings? And not being afraid to ask someone, you know, do you ever feel so bad that you wish you could just die? Are you having thoughts of suicide? These are things that most of us are very uncomfortable talking about and, and asking about. But if we are able to do that and give someone a chance to express that, 
we can save lives. We can prevent suicides. And in many cases, I believe we can prevent mass violence as well for those people who are suicidal and also homicidal. So there are uh, countless opportunities to try to help people in every aspect of society. The school systems can do much to teach children, you know, what is good mental health? What is mental wellness? How can you tell if, if your thoughts are bad and causing you discomfort? And what do you do about that? Who are the adults in your life that you can talk to? Who would you talk to if, you, if one of your friends told you that they were thinking of killing themselves? So the schools can play a huge role. Medicine can play a huge role. What about emergency rooms and people going because they're having bad thoughts, anxiety, suicidal thoughts? Um, what about the family practitioner? What, you know, what about uh, corrections? What about our churches and, and uh, you know, our clergy? What can they do to help and counsel? Jillian Peterson thinks any approach to prevention needs to go beyond punishment. For one thing, Someone who's suicidal doesn't really care about being punished, even punishments as severe as, say, the death penalty. This is unfortunately not a problem that you can suspend or expel your way out of. We're advocating more of a care team approach. So there's threat assessment teams which are really focused on, is this person a threat or not? Versus the care team is thinking about, okay, this person has expressed that they want to do this. In many ways, that's them saying that they don't care if they live or die. How can we bring them back into this community? Who has the closest connection with them? Who can reach out and talk to them and figure out what type of resources they need? Is this mental health? Is it substance abuse? Is it social services? Is this peer support? Uh, What can we do long term to bring the student back into this community and get rid of the grievance? This approach has already stopped some mass shootings. There have been cases of students who had planned something and the school really embraced them back in. There was a principal we talked to who talked a shooter down who was in the bathroom on his own. And the shooter was dressed in camouflage and holding two shotguns so the principal was able to kind of talk him down. And that principal said that really the best violence prevention method he knows is to have good, strong relationships with students because that will make it so students tell you when they're concerned about other students and make it so you have relationships in place that you notice when somebody's off and you can connect with them and try to get them through the crisis. Many political leaders in the U.S. call mass shooters evil. Their crimes are horrendous. There's no denying that. But Sue points out that talking about shooters in this way is dangerous. When one of the people I loved most in this world did one of the most horrible things that had ever been done in this country, I had trouble looking at my youngest child, who was my precious boy that I was so proud of, as evil. And I know the world viewed him as evil, but I could not see him as evil. But everywhere I went, people were calling him evil, they were calling us evil, and, and what I concluded was that if we look at incidents like this and we reduce it down to this is either good or evil, it is, it's, a, it's a dangerous, useless precedent because it's unactionable. If we just look at some people and say these people are evil, then that doesn't give society any shared responsibility in how to help anybody who is struggling. So, you know, I don't believe that we should look at this problem as an issue of good and evil. It's too simple. Um, I know too many people who have struggled and up to the moments of their death, they were struggling and, you know, with their own morality, their own religious principles. They were uh, unable to control their behavior because something in their thought process had broken down. And uh, so, you know, I don't like the idea of lumping acts that hurt other people all under uh, the umbrella of evil. I think if we do that, we're never going to be able to examine how to help people before they get to that place in their lives.
Only a very small proportion of people who are suicidal become mass shooters. But the vast majority of mass shooters want to die. What makes someone go from being suicidal to homicidal? They think they've been victimized, and they want to go down in history as having done something big. That transition from being suicidal to homicidal, it's often put on fast forward by a crisis at work or in a relationship. And mass shooters, especially younger ones, often drop clues and leak details of their plans to others. Recognizing all of this creates a window, an opportunity to intervene. As the number of mass shootings continues to rise, some of us may start to recognize the warning signs we talked about in this episode and what to do in response. Now we've seen some really striking changes uh, since the series of attacks that just occurred, primarily in Gilroy, California, uh, and in El Paso, and in Dayton, Ohio. We've seen an uptick in people being willing to report behaviors of concern. The question is whether people will continue to do that. Uh, there have been, I think, a, a, at, last, at last count, there are like a 28 publicized successful interdictions by police um, that may have stopped uh, somebody from carrying out a, a mass murder. So there, there may be hope that people now are much more willing to report behaviors of concern than they were prior to the series of attacks that we've just seen in the United States. Next time, we'll look at one option for disarming would-be shooters before they kill, red flag laws. Politicians on both sides of the aisle have started to come out in favor of red flag laws. But who do these laws target and how well do they work? That's next time on In Sickness and in Health. If someone you know is in crisis or thinking of hurting themselves, do not leave them alone. Remove any firearms, alcohol, drugs, or sharp objects that could be used in a suicide attempt. Take them to an emergency room or seek help from a medical or mental health professional. Call the U.S. National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-TALK. That's 800-273-8255. Or text the crisis text line at 741-741. Another resource for LGBTQ youth is the Trevor Project's Lifeline at 866-488-7386. Today's episode of In Sickness and in Health was produced by Zach Dyer and me. Our theme music is by Alan Vest. Additional music by the Blue Dot Sessions. If you enjoy the show, please tell a friend about it today. And if you haven't already done so, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps more people find out about the show. You can learn more about this podcast and how to engage with us on social media at insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. That's insicknessandinhealthpodcast.com. I'm Dr. Celine Gounder. This is In Sickness and in Health. <laughs>